Good evening. I am Dorothe Amber, Director of the Norton School, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the seventh installment of the Baumer Conversations. The conversations curated by Eric Herman, John Davis, and Yas Motoyama revisit our previous lecture series format with a presentation by invited guest, followed by a response discussion facilitated by Norton faculty, in this evening's case, my colleague, Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture, Paula Meyerink. The Balmer conversations are intended to be of the time in more than one way. They are a record of current projects, research, and practices across the three domains of Norton, architecture, landscape, and planning. They register the evolution of practice, exchanges between research and practice, and new interpretations of our disciplines. They also offer a platform to examine the role of design and planning through the lens of current events. The call for a more just and inclusive education system has led us to revise our curricula, search for more diverse design precedents, and a wider spectrum of historical narratives. Likewise, we need to foreground the impact of design on our social environment in the way we discuss design, and I use design in the broader sense of the term here. The act of making has implications, just like the verb to make is an action that elicits reactions. What we make may make people feel, act, and experience. Bringing professional practice and speculative design into the academe offers the perfect forum for testing these questions. This preamble brings us to tonight's speaker, Gary Hildebrand, whose rigorous approach to design, research, and teaching should generate ample material for discussing the role of landscape architecture in directing as well as responding to public experience and public action. Gary Hildebrand is a founding principal of Reed Hildebrand, a firm just shy of 60, located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. A virtual stroll through the firm's portfolio will reveal a number of high-profile cultural institutions, from the Clark Art Institute with Tada Wando to the Clifford Steel Museum with Brad Klopfil, as well as reframings of historical urban spaces and landscapes, such as the iconic Mount Auburn Cemetery, Boston City Hall Plaza, and Lutchens and Jico's Marshfield Gardens in England. This tightly controlled and beautifully detailed collection of landscapes is paired with an equally engaging series of investigations, sometimes under the guise of research projects or master plans, sometimes as difficult, in the best sense of the term, difficult commissions. Among these are a few that I believe Gary will present here, the Washington DC Tidal Basin, Tidal Basin Ideas Lab, the Action Plan for Boston Franklin's Park, and the Master Plan for the Alamo Plaza in San Antonio. These are worthy of mention, not simply because they exemplify Reed Hildebrand's ambition to create, and I quote, landscapes of cultural consequence, but also because they illustrate Gary's pursuit of a discipline at the intersection of research, teaching, and practice. Gary Hildebrand has taught at the Harvard Graduate School of Design for 30 years, where he's now the Hornbeck Professor of Practice. But what is most remarkable is that he's been a revered instructor and critic for 30 years. And this is no doubt to these informing teaching with research and carrying out research through practice. To name but an example of this fluidity between the different domains of landscape architecture, his text on shade and shadow, the design studio on trees for Washington DC, and the Cambridge Urban Forest Master Plan all coalesce into the effort to test, measure, and explicate the medium of landscape architecture. One speaks of the artist's artist. Gary described landscape architect Rich Haig as a teacher's teacher. I think that would make Gary a landscape architect's teacher. Gary, welcome to the virtual, virtual Knowlton School. Thank you, Dorte, um, for the kind words. That's very, very nice. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to um, launch right away uh, with uh, sharing uh, some slides with you on the screen. Uh, it's fantastic to be at the Knowlton School, um, such a revered school, and, um, and really truly one of the very best landscape architecture programs anywhere. Um, our time is short tonight, so I'm going to launch. Uh, if you'll just give me a minute. Uh, hopefully my audio is okay. And Dorte, if you, oh, wait a minute, sorry. Something is having trouble. 
having trouble with the audio. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, okay. Let me try this again. Okay, we're good? Okay, thank you. Uh, these two photographs are two of the worlds that I inhabit. And the one on the left is our, our office in Cambridge in Central Square, Massachusetts. Uh, the other is the well-known trays as we call them at the GSD. And I spend most of my time in these two spaces. I'm going to say that in a pre-COVID world, these are my two, uh, the places where you're most likely to find me if it's not on an airplane or in, a for, in another city. What I wanna say is that all worlds are real. All practices have to be real and all practices have to be speculative. But I think this is also true at school. Surely you at the Knowlton School are living in a world of speculation. But I also feel that world is real. And I want you to think that it's not right for anyone to say, well, when you get to the real world, your thinking will be different. It will change. I don't think that's the case. I'm going to just narrate a little bit about our practice and then talk about teaching for a while. And then I will um, talk about three contemporary projects. Um, so a little bit of beauty at the beginning where I'm just gonna say that we managed over the last 25 years to you know, start small and get larger, start with small projects and build them well and carefully and to try to turn that into more sophisticated commissions. Uh, Dorte nicely mentioned Marsh Court, which um, we got great recognition for this year from the American Society of Landscape Architects, a seven year effort to restore what I think might be Lutchen's most beautiful house and surely one of Gertrude Jekyll's most complex arrangements. And um, I spent 16 years um, fashioning four different phases of work at the Clark. And uh, the Clark Art Institute as was also mentioned by Dorothy. So it, over the years, these projects, these commissions would become more and more complex. But I would say that really a touchstone in our firm, um, something that really changed our, our way of working was getting what we considered to be very challenging, very public urban commissions like the Central Wharf illustrated here. And I can say that when we began to work on the Central Wharf, I think we got it because we made a convincing argument for it as a public space. It was actually a private piece of land that we turned public through philanthropy. Um, I could say that we didn't exactly know how to do this well. So we looked to history as we always do, understanding how you make a street, how you plant in the city, how you make a plaza. And honestly, I learned from this, these are both Ajay photographs and the one on the right I'm very fond of because it demonstrates that the way of making the surface in the city might be done by hand. It might be organic, it might be like a skin, it might breathe. You might be able to pick it up and put it back together again. And this was really instrumental for us. We also have always turned to art. And these photographs, one by Alfred Stieglitz, the other on the right, just a couple of years later by Edward Steichen, celebrating, you know, I think, metropolitanism in the beautiful work of Cass Gilbert in the Flatiron Building in New York. But these are not about the Flatiron. These are about nature as a lens to view the city. And so this was really where we were turning our intellectual attention. We were also realizing, and I have to say that it was students that led me to this, to just to understand that there's a science of urban forestry that is funded by our government 
that is making better arguments for vegetation management and planting in the city than we ever did. And so it was really through work in design studios and seminars that I began to um, truly understand that we could argue that there are more than spatial and aesthetic benefits for urban vegetation. We came up with this kind of formulation on the completion of the central wharf that on the top, we have all these things we want to achieve. We want to have a spatial, spatially beautiful world. We want it to be cooled. We want to intercept the rainfall and store um, uh, storm water runoff. We want to sequester carbon and so on, but we can't do that. We cannot do that if we don't provide the life support and the system systematic infrastructure below grade that's needed. And our firm really turned itself um, seriously to the science of urban soil. We work with soil scientists everywhere we work. We've done our own kind of self-funded research projects to understand how the work is performing, whether it's performing to specification. And, and as we you know, got better at this, the commissions get larger. And you know, one of our current projects is uh, Water Street, Tampa, we're building now six blocks of what will be a 30 block downtown regeneration. And this is uh, six blocks of this is under construction now. Uh, it's, it's essentially going to build a new downtown for Tampa in a place that was kind of devastated by urban renewal. And in order to make this kind of work durable and lasting and beautiful, I think you really have to apply this kind of knowledge and I have just found that my teaching activities have um, really made a difference in how we think about this work and how we produce the work. This is how we are now thinking about, you know, the problem of encapsulated soils in a sidewalk. And if you told me when I was a kid that I would be interested professionally in making a sidewalk, I probably would have stayed in a rock band. But this has become <laughs> actually a very vital part of our practice. And so it's professionally very satisfying. Uh, I taught a uh, seminar for a couple of years called uh, Vegetal City. And one year I turned that course entirely around about the, the use of the London Plain as, a, as the infrastructure tree of choice in the 19th century and in part of the 20th century. We're, we're being talked out of it now. But, you know, we proved that if you only draw the 54,000 London Plains planted in the extension of Barcelona. You understand urban form there. I also want to say that we never allow, we, we talk all the time about the performance of urban vegetation, but I never want to hear about performance without also hearing about phenomena like shadow and spatial beauty. Uh, you know, the thing that the above grade condition of the tree gives to us all the time. I then turned my teaching to streets and um, I had an idea that um, New York is pretty easy for us to access usually, uh, maybe not so right now, um, to run a couple of studios on what it would be like if we could take the most important streets and turn them to far greater public realm access. And I didn't invent that idea. Um, that idea was being promulgated by the Bloomberg administration. And so um, I you know, sort of turned to the street as we have in our practice and in my teaching. So you know, the street a hundred years ago, a little more than a hundred years ago was an undifferentiated surface that was not controlled. And so in a way, uh, you know, it was a kind of um, field condition that was available, whether you were on foot or horse or cart or, or unicycle or whatever. But for the last hundred years, our streets have essentially become binary with about 75% of the street devoted to vehicles moving and maybe even way less than 25% devoted to people on foot or on bicycles. And so I, this problem is a very interesting one to me. So, you know, in the 30s and 40s, it became very important to order the street in that binary way to prevent 
uh, well, to produce um, safety. And if you think about the way much of New York is today in many of our cities, and th that would include Columbus, um, they're chaotic at times. And this subject was really pushed forward and enlightened for me by Jeanette Sadek Khan's book. You know, uh, she essentially is making the case that the street is contested space, that it's no longer the purview of traffic planners. That is over. That paradigm is old. Uh, the street is now the, par the, the, the purview of people who think like we do about managing a public realm that is accessible and inviting and welcoming. And they proved it in New York. They took traffic off Broadway and everyone squawked and said, this is never going to work. And it works pretty darn well. I then went north on Broadway to um, Columbus, uh, uh, the intersection of Columbus Avenue and um, Broadway, which is where Lincoln Center is. And then I also went back down and uh, went to the Penn Station. So three studios in a row that were um, uh, examining this issue of uh, increased public realm, uh, increased permeability, increased overhead vegetation, increased soil management, and actually uh, reducing the amount of vehicle traffic. I'm a strong believer that that will happen, not because of automatic uh, automated vehicles necessarily, but because we need to make better investments in mass transit. And because the current generation of young people in New York is not even owning cars. So we were talking also about opening up the subway to the sky and linking that to the, um, uh, the, the arrival place where musicians arrive and where people from outside the city arrive at Lincoln Center. Why not open the subway to the sky? It is in, in the outer boroughs, it's open to the sky. And, and really rethinking the code for how people behave in the city. I'm mainly talking about crosswalks here, but I, in these studios, I have gotten the students to think telescopically about the size of a paver and the pattern of a neighborhood. So uh, this is just kind of one example where a kind of geometric order was arrived at, an unusual one, which could then become a kind of defining language for traffic control, pedestrian safety, and the same order could also help us discover where to plant, where, where we could make permeability. Could we even make furniture out of that order? And so we're, in a sense, rewriting the DNA, the code for how we make the city street and giving the cars some room, but not as much as they have today. Um, we, we started thinking about the idea that, that uh, the Penn Station was probably gonna um, change dramatically when the Farley Post Office building becomes a new station. Madison Square Garden happens to have a lease that expires in a year. And so we said, well, you know, it used to be grand to arrive in New York, cross the Brooklyn Bridge, just grand or Ellis Island. It was grand to arrive in Penn Station. That only lasted for 50 years. It was taken down and on, in its place was a kind of money machine. I, I think of it as a kind of coin piggy bank. And that meant that 600,000 people a day were funneled through a basement. And um, Vincent Scully once said, you know, you used to arrive like a prince in New York now you scuttle in like a rat. And that's what Penn Station feels like to any of us that have been there or go there. Here's the Farley building, it's going to become the new station. And so we think change could really happen here. And if so, we could make the largest public space in New York City. That's you know the largest paved plaza in New York City. So this project imagines a forest over top the station. This project lifts the roof of the station to give a kind of very big spatial effect, uh, but then a, a, a very big, big, big tilted plaza in the city. This project thinks about the arrival of trains being signaled through the surface of the plaza uh, in a day when you will no longer get a ticket, but you'll have uh, your, your seat assignment on your phone, um, this can be signaled. And so, you know, we're, we're looking at pattern and generating entire languages of open space and public realm through that. 
And at that point, uh, in the end of the semester, we put together this exhibition at school, which uh, in a way gave us a kind of new geography of the public realm uh, in the area of Penn Station. Um, last year, my fall studio um, just changed subjects uh, completely and went to um, the Eastern shore of Virginia where climate change is very directly being felt. And um, so it was the first time I'd really turned my attention to that issue. Uh, my current studio is in the Tidal Basin in Washington, DC. And um, it's really also facing dire issues of sea level rise. Um, the first half of that studio is about the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial, which is already underwater some days. And the next part, which begins tomorrow, is really about um, the designated place for free speech in the National Mall. Uh, through all of this, I've come to thinking that um, our work is always political, especially our urban work. Now, I'm going to turn to our um, action plan for Franklin Park. So from here, I'm not going to show you built work. I'm going to show you what we're currently thinking about in projects like um, the idea that we might have a rehabilitation master plan for one of Olmsted's great works. It is part of the system. I think the landscape architecture students here uh, this evening know this well. Um, beautifully connected system, which went through some real struggles in the 20th century. A 530 acre park um, really considered a kind of masterpiece. Um, We've been discovering relationships to surface geology. It's a drumlin landscape, a kind of glaciated landscape. And we organized our uh, proposal for the project and, and now also the project around the categories of thinking about land, thinking about people and thinking about the nature of a place like this in the middle of the city. It's a really complex project. We are the prime on this project and we have also two uh, primary partners. Um, we have agency who um, really specializes in inclusion and in public engagement and mass design, which also does that. And they are also outstanding architects. And you can see the cluster of, um, of, of the kinds of thinking we have to bring to bear on such a project. Uh, there's another way to show that, you know, we have, I think, 15 different subcontractors in order to mount this project. And I'm going to really flip through these quickly. It's uh, almost approaching six o'clock already. Um, but I think you can get a sense here. Olmsted designed, always designed these parks with um, very uh, uh, kind of precise ways of connecting through and beyond the edges to neighborhoods. And we have to do that again. Um, so much has changed in Boston's history. Uh, and I just would point you to the kind of the middle right of this image where Boston's population declined by more than 200,000 people uh, in the period that sometimes is discussed as white flight, moving people moving to the suburbs. And during that time, massive disinvestment in the neighborhoods and in the park um, and a slow climb back. I'm gonna keep going here. We are in the middle of this diagram. I can't show you any of our design proposals because they're not public yet, but I do wanna show you just some of the ways that, and I'm just going to talk while clicking through these slides, just to give you a sense of the kind of complexity um, that we think is involved in, um, in, 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 in writing a plan that, that seeks over time to kind of resurrect many of the uh, important ideas and principles that were present for the Olmsted firm in the 1890s uh, and even in some periods since um, really need to be captured back. But also we are very aware that if we don't devise a plan that feels like it is rooted in the neighborhoods that surround this park, we will fail. It's very clear to us that this park serves these neighborhoods reasonably well now, but can do much better. But if this park 
seems as if it's become gentrified or too nice in the future, then we will not have met the aims of the people who have put this project together with us. And that's quite something. Uh, you know, I mean, the parks were originated in, in some ways to increase value. We're told now that if we increase value a lot here, we haven't done it right. Because that means that people would have to move. And we don't want any kind of displacement of the people who love this park and use it. Circulation is really complicated in this. There are some beautiful features that remain from the Olmsted firm and um, uh, the years just since then. Um, I wanted to show you these beautiful drawings that um, my colleague Kristen and her teammates uh, have been making. We, we think of these as kind of x-rays because we can read the surface geology. It's as if we can read what's underneath the surface. And we know how important that was in the formation of the park. There was an underlying structure that was completely rooted in the surface geology. Now this was a bunch of farms, but you know, they were able to kind of see past that and to understand and organize the park according to its landform. That got compromised. Or, well, in the, in, in the original plan, it's really quite beautiful. It's, you know, the plan celebrates that very shape of ground. But those places that you see now with the white mask, those are all exceptions to the park now. They've taken the Franklin Park Zoo out of the park. They've put a hospital in the park. They've put a parks um, maintenance facility in the park. And this has truly compromised the originating structure. I think this diagram makes that quite clear. So big interruptions and the result of that really is a kind of fragmentation, ecological fragmentation, um, and to some degree social fragmentation as well. Our need here is to capture back, um, you know, try to make a coherent sense out of a park that has had these incursions. We're looking carefully at the ecology of the edge and also the sociology. We've done interviews. Um, I, I, I dare say that, you know, the, the kind of landmark um, master plan for the rebuilding of the Central Park was done in a room with a bunch of people. Ours for this is being done with a thousand people in neighborhoods, actually several different neighborhoods. And so again, illustrations, I'm sorry to go so fast, but I want us to get to discussion. And um, so just to give you a feel for how kind of urgent the social situation feels, we all, we all feel a certain um, moment, right? And in the, in the need to correct um, 400 years of injustice in our country. Um, you know, the day George Floyd was murdered, Franklin Park became the place to give expression to the anger people felt. This for us kind of cements Franklin Park as crucial in the healing process. And I'm gonna go now just for another few minutes to San Antonio, Texas another project where history is a really kind of the vital um, concern. This is the site of the Alamo, the world famous Alamo, the um, number one site of visitation in all of Texas. Um, those of you who know the Riverwalk can see the adjacencies to the Alamo. The Alamo is a mission, you know, it's got a kind of tawdry history. It was, you know, the missions were essentially places where, um, uh, First Nation peoples were incarcerated and, um, you know, were evangelized. Um, there's also just very strange histories about the Alamo. The, the image on the left is an accurate image of the, um, uh, of the 1836 battle where all of the defenders died. Um, the image on the lower right is the John Wayne movie. They got it right too. But there are countless images which show the church facade, which was built well after the Alamo battle, being the, um, the, the, the image that sticks. And so that's just one of many histories that don't seem right. We're in the middle of a process. It's uh, taken four years. 
And just, just I want to describe here the idea that the Alamo became a church in the late 19th century. And uh, it's, um, its entire precinct was essentially paved over and made into something else. And so you can see that the real boundary of what we're trying to capture back requires us to take a building down, a, you know, a series of buildings, and to create a new perimeter and to move some things. And that has become a very, very, very challenging amount of change in San Antonio. Um, we want to be able to tell the stories. We want to be able to tell the stories of how uh, Native peoples were murdered here. We want to be able to tell the stories of Texas slave owners also acting here. Um, but it turns out that the locals didn't want to tell these stories. We wanted to make the Alamo a place for reverence and learning. And there was a great big force that wanted the Alamo to stay the Alamo, you know, the symbol of Texas freedom. Um, I point you to the cenotaph in the middle of the picture. Um, it's important because we, we, we proposed to move the cenotaph. The cenotaph was um, built on the 100th anniversary of the battle, celebrating the, the um, defenders as they're called. Uh, and so it's been there a hundred years, but it's in the way of, of, of making a, a, a kind of clearer understanding of many histories here. And we said, we were gonna move it. Um, so this is, this is a, a little set of diagrams that says there's kind of preserve the historic artifacts of the barracks and the church, um, clarify the periods of significance and you know, understand the footprint of the mission. Um, there are a whole lot of non-contributing features that really need to be removed. There was a Ripley's, believe it or not, just across the street from the church. That's gone, thank you. Um, and so, uh, and then try to express the significance of the, uh, the cases, the water systems that uh, were historically important uh, in a very dry climate. So that was our proposal. Make, take the non-contributing things away, choreograph approaches to the site and develop a unified and coherent experience. And so um, we have been, uh, we've completed working drawings on the first phase. Now, again, I can point you to, uh, if you can see my cursor, we proposed to move the cenotaph here in front of the uh, Mercer Hotel and uh, the, the Medgar Hotel. And, and that creates this plaza with also a great connection to the Riverwalk, that requires closing Alamo Street. That was for a long time, the biggest controversy. The locals didn't want it closed, uh, but they really didn't want the story told. Um, but you can see here the kind of rendering where the museum now fronts onto the, the historic precinct. And that's the plan that was ultimately approved by the city of San Antonio, the city council. Um, here's a, a vision of the, um, Cenotaph moved uh, to the Mega Hotel, and you can see the church in the background, and um, so on. And you know, this is sort of like the living history, telling the stories. Um, and you know, we so this is kind of the idea. We've been working to create a boundary for the plaza, uh, for rather, rather for the precinct, and importantly, we would close the street, create the boundary, but then also allow activity during non-museum non hours to pass through. And this was, uh, in a way, this was a kind of breakthrough. An earlier plan had said we were just gonna close it off and you would have to pay to get in. Um, and we've been working very closely with Machado and Silvetti on the museum. And um, here, I, I think I just wanted to express that, um, you know, we've been on the project for four years. The architects came on last year and we are really working hand in hand as if there were no boundaries between our work and the work of the architects of the museum. And so um, I think this is the last slide for the Alamo, but I wanted to say that um, just a few weeks ago, the Texas State Historic Commission in an all day hearing determined that the cenotaph could not move. And so we have our working drawings all ready to go to work on this plaza. And 
we don't know what's going to happen now. But this is, um, again, where I would say maybe that, you know, our work becomes really kind of political. Now, um, this is the title basin, my last um, slide. And I'm, I want to ask Eric now to play this three minute video and then we can have our conversation and we'll have at least some time to do that. Eric, are you able to do that? I'm stopping sharing. I'm Gary Hildebrand and I'm joined Great. by my partner, Eric Kramer. We call our project an open work because we are looking ahead 100 years and because we can be sure that assumptions will change over time. We do this also because open work embraces the idea we have, do we have that the, the work is contingent and layered, indeterminate, inclusive, and therefore humane. We have good models for measuring climate vulnerabilities and the predicting audio likely yeah. environmental scenarios, but we cannot exactly predict social change. Instead, we must shape a kind of projection of the future and develop conviction around what kind of people we want to become. In 1902, the Senate Park Commission didn't just react to their times, and we won't either. They envisioned a transformed city of the future. We embraced the strength of their plan as a metropolitan vision. While the monumental core got most of the attention, the Commission's report centers on the Washington Common, an inclusive landscape for Washingtonians. We see value in thinking of the Tidal Basin as a Washington Common for our time, integrating it with the monumental core but celebrating and accentuating difference. As such, our vision for the Tidal Basin's future isn't radical, nor is it solely responsive to climate change. It's a vision of the future, where the essential qualities of the Tidal Basin are preserved and where its design realizes even greater power from the overlapping systems of the Mall and the Potomac, where it feels resolved and clear, but not fixed and perfected, where its equally commemorative landscape, recreational parkland, an ecologically vibrant living system, and where integrated and strategic orientations of landform protect the monumental core from flooding and shape a more dynamic relationship with the daily tides. The lasting power of the tidal basin is its constant reinvention, a continuum of changing cultural and environmental influences over time. The tidal basin has been shaped by the tools of engineering and infrastructure in the name of beautification and park building, and for collective commemoration and memorialization. Today, this heritage is at risk from rising seas and subsiding land. This treatment framework enables action, a kind of continuous adaptation. When elements can be preserved in place, we reinforce them. When not feasible, we propose migration. And we balance preservation with a vision for continued progress forward including a series of future-minded interventions. The new Capitol Overlook marks the axis down Maryland Avenue from the Capitol as it meets the fluid edge of the Potomac. Cherries migrate upland, continuing to embrace the basin and seasonal spectacle. A network of open lawns and shaded groves creates gathering areas and shapes our arrival at the now protected memorials. At the scale of the individual experience, a network of walks and circuits provides a choreography of views, a rhythm of sun and shade, and shifting relationships between land and water. But greatest expression comes where these paths overlap. Here, at Independence Rise, a pedestrian bridge scribes the geometry of the city into the park. Elevated landform protects the mall from flooding, and a series of stepped terraces regularize the marsh walk into a space for gathering and watching the tides. This new Washington Common galvanizes the regional vision of the Senate Park Commission over a hundred years ago, a shaded, cooling, connective parkland for the people. It also envisions the Tidal Basin as a dynamic complement to Washington's steadfast monumental core, forever an open and flexible work in progress. I'm Gary Hildebrand and I'm joined by my partner Eric Kramer. We call our project an open work because we are looking ahead 100 years. I'm Gary Hildebrand and I'm joined by my partner.
anything on my end in the booth here. And for me. Uh, but um, that's okay. Um, for the audience also, uh, Dorothy and I have a history with Gary. Um, <laughs> we were at the GSD at the same time. Um, both of us, Dorothy and I, moved to different places. So it's really great, actually, uh, that Gary's here with us at Knowlton. Much appreciated. And thank you again, Gary, for a fantastic lecture. You're welcome. Um, maybe also noteworthy, uh, Gary is the first person I ever taught with. In fact, he introduced me to Teaching Design Studio, a first year class uh, at Harvard. So really, really nice. Thank you. Mm. Um, Thank you also to Eric Herman for making this all possible and to solve technical issues when they come up. And it's quite amazing the complex platform through which this is made possible. Um, participating in the, um, this platform as a Baumer is new to me. Uh, Gary, um, I particularly appreciated the continued historical nar narrative that I think uh, travels throughout your career, including your books, and I'll get to that in a little bit, uh, the nature of your work. But I would think there is one part where there is a fundamental change. Uh, when you joined Doug Reed uh, in establishing this practice, your practice, uh, there was an emphasis on private gardens and residence estates yeah, uh, with great uh, detailing and spatial control and, and a varied plant palette, right? That, that drove the work in your office at the time. Uh, while now that transition is much different. So you are fully engaged in public projects. And I would imagine that public projects take the bulk of your work and engagement in the office. Um, how would you say, when did that transition happen? Uh, maybe there's a project in particular where that transition from private to practice happened. Uh, and how, how do both arenas or design fields, if you will, uh, complement or influence each other? Uh, thanks for the question, Paula. Um, we did start the practice with a handful of uh, really great residential commissions. And, you know, we were a firm of five people for quite a while, um, happily do executing projects like that, mostly in the region. And, you know, we got a call from someone in Texas who had read a book of mine and uh, we ended up starting to do some residences in Texas. Our goal was always to have more, have a greater impact. And I, I just know this is really true for us all as, you know, in education, you know, you, you want to do the work for a greater good and you want to make things beautiful, but you want them to have impact. You want even to be influential in a way. And so um, we were very lucky to get, two local commissions that were private institutions, but were exceedingly public space, the Mount Auburn Cemetery and the Christian Science Plaza renovations. Um, we, we couldn't imagine our firm today without those commissions because they, uh, with, through private resources and through the know-how that we had essentially built through our small practice, um, we were able to have an impact on the public realm. And I'd say that was um, the biggest shift and that's uh, in the early years of our firm in 1998 and 99. You know, we were both in our forties when we started this firm. So, um, you know, we, we both had lots of public realm experience but not together. And we had, a you know, when Doug worked at Child Associates, you know, he worked on pretty big public commissions. And when I was at Sasaki, I also did, you know, lots of institutional work, but it was actually then a kind of a slow transition to greater complexity, which I also described, you know, for you this evening in the talk.
thank you. That's 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 uh, good to hear. Um, Gary, here in school with students and colleagues, we are uh, all working on um, climate change, uh, big ecological questions, um, and also diversity, right? These yeah. really three um, different but cohesive pillars of where we are right now uh, in both the society and in landscape architecture. Yeah. Uh, what advice would you have uh, to landscape architects and students? Uh, both groups of people are listening in today um, to prepare for the future. Um, I, I think I have found myself saying this for some time, but I do commonly say to students these days that um, there is no better time to be entering a professional field than to be entering landscape architecture right now. In some ways, I feel like we are firming up the base that was created by Vitruvius, who said architects, and by that I think he meant designers of all kinds who work in the environment. He said architects need to understand the climate and they need to understand the different waters that they work in. Uh, this, this is a quote I read a few years ago, and, and, and to me, it seemed as if it was a kind of prediction for the environmental design fields, uh, because we can't do it without understanding weather and climate. And then I would go to, you know, American landscape architecture as a, as a discipline and as a profession emerges as a reform movement in the 19th century. It was really start, you know, started by reforming cities, re pro big proposals for reforming cities. And they were for the same reasons that I think we now could describe our work as well-being. I think we produce well-being for the public. And I think anything, anything that we do in the, in the in the public realm has to contribute to a better life for people. I mean, you know, it, you could describe that as a moral stance. I happen to believe it's true. And so um, it's, it's just very interesting to me that, you know, in the, within the last 20 years with um, the digital tools that we have and the command over our geography and over data, those tools have enabled landscape architecture to, um, to think larger and to um, participate in really in the large questions that are facing our urban populations. I, I sometimes say it this way. When I was in school in the eighties and you were in school in the nineties, it was hard to draw a river. It was hard to draw a drumlin or a large surface on a sheet of vellum or a piece of mylar. We can now draw the world. It's right at our fingertips. And I really believe that the revolution in our information management and in representation has made it possible for the fields of landscape architecture, architecture and planning to engage more deeply the questions, the social questions before us, the economic questions before us in the city. And that's also true for the issues of climate and let's say fairness in housing and justice. Those are all uh, available to us now. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a whole flurry of questions coming in. Uh, and I'd, although I have about 10 questions for you, some of them nuts and bolts and others more philosophical, but I would like to put my own needs on the back burner right <laughs> now and foreground uh, other people's questions. And the first person actually is Claire Agra from Baltimore. Um, and Hi, Claire. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? 
So I'm going to read for you her question for you uh, here. Your work is always oriented towards the long view. That's smart. <laughs> How do you personally resist the constant, with capitals, the constant societal expectation for instant, impulsive, faster, fleshy, trend-driven driven design? What a beautiful question that is. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you, Clara. I, I like this question too. Um, uh, one, one thing I think that uh, Doug and I and our, our partners and our senior staff are really aware of is that if a project somehow is viewed as in need of flash or trend, we don't get the job. <laughs> it, I, I think it's kind of as simple as that. So. I think that um, when we get a commission, uh, I think I think people understand our approach already, and so it's it's actually a little bit rare. It does happen, but you know, if if someone wants something trendy, you know, or um, you know, really jazzed up they know where to go and not to come here. <laughs> well, given your portfolio, there's no, there's also need for different, for diversity of work, right? Yes, so, for sure. Uh, Claire, thank you. Um, Dorothe has a, oh, actually, let's go to um, Peter Boyer. Uh, he's a pr prospective MLA student, right? So Great. prospective MLA student, student who's not here, is following this talk uh, and posed the question. So that's really great to see. Um, I see themes of making positive change in your work ecologically, socially. How effective do you feel landscape architecture is as creating positive change? How good do we do our job? And should we do better? <clears throat> yeah, we don't always do it well. Um, you know, in, in, um, in one of the essays in our monograph, um, 2013, um, called On Seeing, I wrote that there is a kind of um, quiet and care in our work. Claire was referring to that in a way. Uh, and you mentioned it too. Um, but also uh, I was recognizing that I see a lot in the world that is overdone, overcomplicated, and maybe not very deeply considered. And so one of the reasons that we um, probe so deeply with our clients is that it takes um, being deeply informed to make good work and to make positive change as in Peter's question. This is not easy stuff. And um, I don't want to make light of, of it. There, there is a big industry out there and some of us take this work very seriously and do it very carefully and do it for the long haul. Not all. Um, do you think we make an impact as landscape architect in a changing environment? I sure do. I sure do. Um, I think making a better street and sidewalk makes the public realm better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, I think to be learned about what it takes to make a good sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love, you know, and always have loved that, you know, my work teaches me about ordinary things, why they are the way they are. And, and then, you know, as a designer, I have the power to change them and make them improved. I love that. That is, that is what design is to me. It's, it's, an, it's being empowered to make positive change, as in the question. Uh, thank you, Gary. Um, I'll continue with questions. And now from Dorothy. Uh, and since we only have 200 characters per question, she did it in, in an A and a B or a one and a two. So uh, 
here it comes, with monuments and memorialization called into question, mm. can you see, one, a change in the reception of the Alamo project in the current context? And two, an opportunity for landscape to carry some of the memory recall. What a beautiful description, memory recall. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Um, well, um, I think Darte's question is really the, the very topic of my two-part studio this fall. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, I, I think that... Um, the most, one of the most potent images of the last period, of the last four months to me has been the image of the Robert E. Lee statue being remade through paint and flowers and um, ephemera. So uh, what I'd like to say is that I think and, 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 you know, I've done a lot of reading about this. I, I spent my entire summer reading in preparation for the fall studio, reading um, James Baldwin and um, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, also reading um, figures around them. Um, and then also reading contemporary scholarship on the mall, on King and um, on questions of monumentality. And we've had fantastic discussions in the studio. And the issue that comes up again and again, and, and um, a writer named Kevin Bruniel really puts this beautifully in a piece he wrote a couple of years ago, critiquing the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. He says, you know, we may be past the time when we should be embodying memory in the shape of a figure. Mm -hmm. And it may be, that we need to be thinking about memorializing events and times and not individuals. And so I think that the, one of the most potent things in, in addition to seeing the Confederate um, monuments, you know, being um, eviscerated and, and in Boston, you know, the, Christ the Christopher Columbus monument which you will remember from Waterfront Park was beheaded a couple of days after George Floyd's murder, because we know about, you know, we know some difficult histories uh, around um, Christopher Columbus's activities uh, in, during his day. Um, the thing that comes up now constantly is the ephemeral. And so one of the most important images to me is Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington. And it's really interesting to think that with paint, and volunteer action, something has been created that commemorates something that was really terrible, which was federal police action against peaceful protesters. This can't stand, you know, I, and this really makes me emotional. And, but the point is that it's through ephemeral acts, I think, that we can commemorate. So I'm gonna guess that Black Lives Matter Plaza will be will reappear annually, right? And why not? It's made of paint. It costs $400, but it's really significant. It signifies, right? It signifies, it, it gives expression to an angry moment that is connected to 400 years of torture. And so, um, very timely question for me. <laughs> uh, thank you, Gary. I know you have a public engagement in... 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'd like to squeeze in one more, yeah, of one more question from Jake Boswell. Hi, Gary. Uh, thanks for an excellent lecture. Can you speak to how you see Reed Hildebrand's efforts towards public engagement in the design process. Uh, changing in the wake of the contemporary movement of social justice, do you see that change cutting across the discipline? 
Yeah, thanks, Jake. Um, I do. I, uh, I, I want to be a little bit cautious um, about something, which is that, and, and it, in some way, you know, it probably is not right to say this. I was thinking back to Claire's, Claire Agre's question about, you know, things that are in the moment. Um, you know, history teaches us that perspective really matters. And so um, there's no turning back on the question of engagement for work in the public realm. And as I mentioned, you know, we have a firm that does that better than we do. And so that we asked them to be on our team. We, we actually conceived of it together there had to be a prime contractor, that's us, but, but, but Gina Ford and I you know, met as soon as we heard that the Franklin Park project was going to be a project and said, you know, we could do this together because we have strengths and they have strengths. There's no turning back on the recognition. And as I, as I said, you know, I've had this discussion with Ethan Carr and others too. We, we cannot produce a rehabilitation action plan for Franklin Park that isn't fully grounded in the voices of the people that surround that park and use it. So no turning back there. Will the current moment be another strong influence? Yes. Um, we now talk about whether Franklin Park, you know, has had a history of white space um, you know, there's a very large immigrant population and there's a large African-American population. Um, and in some ways they have felt excluded from the park. In other cases, that's not so, but um, I do think this moment will change us. I fervently hope so because, you know, we, we really must, you know, be on the road to correcting injustices so um, I can't say how, and I, as I say, my caution is that we should go carefully um, to put practices into place that, um, that we won't regret. Mm -hmm. Gary, thank you very, very much for, the, for being with us tonight. It was a great honor. Um, I will be re-watching uh, this talk, mm -hmm. conversation, maybe skip over my own part, but mm -hmm. okay. Um, thank you very much um, and for your generosity and great insights in your projects. Thank you, Paula. It's been a pleasure. Thanks to you and Eric and Dorte and hi to all my friends at Knowlton School. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>